last week. Um, I did not get to the last a few verses in chapter 3. I'm going to start at chapter 3 and verse 18. And I'm going to read, read uh, the rest of the verses there in 1 Peter chapter 3. And if you would, follow along with me. And then keep your finger there and you can reference, reference the verses. And you're especially going to need to in this section as I preach. Um, that you're going to need to refer back to these verses. Uh, this is some hard stuff to understand. And, and there's a number of different opinions about it. And I'm going to give you mine. So, verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Well, that's, that's easy enough. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also He went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. That was in the ark. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. So, the first sentence in verse 18 there. The first sentence says, it's kind of a because or a reason for the last verse that we looked at last week, which I will paraphrase in this way, that even though some people will still insult us and persecute us as Christians, no matter how much grace and kindness we show them, we are, it is still better for us, and we are still supposed to respond to them as God tells us to, which means we are not to respond with sin, sinful hate and, and similar insults and the type of the way that, that people are treating us. Even, even though when we um, do things right to start with with them, even though we don't respond in hate and insults of our own to start with, even if they continue to insult us and so forth, we are, we are to continue to respond the way God says to. And Jesus is the ultimate example of suffering and doing what is right. Believers then should follow His example and... It's actually not just relative to verse 17 there in 1 Peter 3, but um, re really even applies to what we looked at in verses 8 through 17 in chapter 3. And as Jesus rose to victory after His death on the cross, so too believers will one day rise to victory after death. Because Jesus, the righteous one, died for us who are the what? The unrighteous ones, so that we could be forgiven of our sins and have our great hope. And our great hope, of course, is that great promise of salvation that is ours. Now, next again in these verses, we're going to get into some stuff that there, there are quite a number of different interpretations of. I'm going to explain my opinion of them. I'm not going to try to get in and tell you all the other options. Some of you maybe have heard some of the other options. This also ties into Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Uh, these these verses and, and those verses in Ephesians kind of go together to develop, I will just say, the, the belief, the doctrine that between His death on the cross and His resurrection, Jesus descended into um, Hades, it should say, um, some people say hell, uh, and preached to someone there. Um, that's actually even in something they call the Apostles' Creed, which actually wasn't written by the Apostles, but um, I will tell you, I don't agree with any of that interpretation and any of that stuff. And I'm going to be sharing with you what I do believe out of these verses, but it does tie back to Ephesians. I could probably take a whole sermon and just talk about all that stuff, but I'm not going to. As always, I would be glad to discuss any of this stuff with any of you at any, any time. But for now, verse 18, look at it again. It says, Jesus was put to death in the what? In the body, but made alive by the by the Spirit. And I think that just refers to, of course, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead after His crucifixion by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 19 says, through whom, through whom referring to the Holy Spirit, through whom He, Jesus, also went and preached. So that's to say that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus went and preached. Jesus preached through the Holy Spirit somehow. You've got to hold on to that idea because we're going to touch on that here in a little bit. It indicated that the preaching was accomplished through the working of the Holy Spirit. 
Who was preached to? And when were they preached to? That's the question. Well, the second part of verse 19 and the first part of verse 20 in the NIV says, the preaching was to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago in the days of Noah. Now, the New American Standard Bible translates it this way, pretty close, but it says, the spirits now in prison, indicating that the spirits were in prison at the time Peter wrote the, the letter of 1 Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but not when they were actually preached to. When were they actually preached to? From this account, from verse 20. When were they actually preached to? In the days of Noah. And so this thing that their, their spirits are now in prison, that's a huge point in certainly the interpretational view that I take. That Jesus preached through the Holy Spirit to unbelieving people in Noah's day, who were, of course, by the time Peter wrote this, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, dead for thousands of years. And they were imprisoned, their spirits were imprisoned in Hades, awaiting their judgment. But the preaching happened while those people were on the earth, before they died, before their, their spirits were sent to be held in prison in Hades, awaiting their resurrection and con condemnation to the lake of fire. So lastly then, we have to say, okay, so how then did Jesus preach through the Holy Spirit to the unbelievers in the days of Noah? Well, I and others think He did so actually through the Holy Spirit working in Noah. So that Noah was the actual one who did the preaching. Now you say, well, wait a minute, it says that Jesus, you just said earlier there that Jesus preached. Yeah, Jesus preached through who? Through the Holy Spirit. Jesus preached through the Holy Spirit. Here's the tie-in. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11 says that the Spirit of Christ, it refers to the Spirit of Christ at work in the Old Testament prophets. Now Noah wasn't an Old Testament prophet, but in the prophets of the Old Testament, Peter had already said in chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit of God was at work in those prophets. And that, that's referring to the fact that the Holy Spirit gave the prophets of the Old Testament the words to say. But who did the actual saying? The prophets themselves did the, the speaking as the Holy Spirit, who is also the Holy Spirit of Jesus, because Jesus is God... Jesus is God. And so it was through the Spirit of Christ, through the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is God, through the Holy Spirit of Jesus, spoke through Noah to these unrighteous people of Noah's day. That's my understanding of this. And I've tried to give some of the, the reasons from Scripture that I think so, that I think it is so. Second Peter, the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5, calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. So there, Noah's actually called a preacher. And that's where we get the idea that even while he was building this big ark, he was what? He was also preaching. And remember, he's preaching to people that had never seen rain, that he's building this great big boat, and there were no big bodies of water anywhere near them. He's talking about gathering up animals, and he's preaching righteousness to them, and the reality is that we would know that none of them responded. Why? Why do we know that what Noah preached to those people in those days about that they needed to seek righteousness through God, how do we know that none of them responded positively to that? How many people get on the ark? Eight people. And those eight people were Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. None of those people he was preaching to responded to the preaching. And they all perished in the flood. The only human beings that survived were those eight people. I think this interpretation fits well the context of 1 Peter chapter 3. It's one of the reasons I believe that's what, it's what's being said here, contrary to what, the way some others interpret it. I believe that it fits the context that Noah did as God commanded him to do when he built the ark and he preached to the people, even though those people surely must have ridiculed him for the reasons I talked about earlier. Remember, if you didn't remember... The earth had not even seen rain yet when, it, when Noah was building the ark. The, the earth was watered by copious dews, heavy dews every night. It hadn't actually even rained yet. These people hadn't seen rain, and Noah's talking about there's going to be water falling from the sky and coming out of the earth, and everything's going to get flooded. And that's why I'm building this big boat, because God told me. <laughs> 
Nobody believed him, and I'm sure they had to have ridiculed him, although the Bible doesn't actually say that. I'm sure that that must have happened. Now, the physical salvation of Noah and his family through the water of the flood is a picture of the spiritual salvation of those of us with true saving faith in Jesus. And those of us with true saving faith in Jesus, that's pictured symbolically by what act that we are commanded to do? Baptism. And that's some of what's being said in these verses that we read through as well. That just as the people, Noah and his family, were saved through the water in their day because of their faith and their response to God, as they were saved through water, so today we are saved, pictured by the physical act of baptism that we're commanded to obey. Now, baptism itself doesn't save anybody, but baptism symbolizes what has already happened to us physically. Meaning that when we accept Christ as our Savior, we're supposed to get baptized to tell the world, I am identifying with Jesus, and this is the picture of what has already happened to me spiritually. That I have been cleansed of my sins. But it's just a, a physical, symbolic act. The people in the early church took it seriously when, when they read the commands, were told of the commands of, of Jesus to be baptized. And people still, still today, there are some people that really take baptism seriously. And you want to know why? You want to know what happens to a lot of Jewish people that, that accept Christ as their Savior? Dr. Randy Smith, who, who lived for quite a number of years in Jerusalem and got his doctorate from the Rabbinical School of Theology in Jerusalem, speaks fluent Hebrew, leads tours in Israel. He says when a Jewish person in Israel, that in a practicing family, a family that's actually practicing Judaism, when that person accepts Jesus, say they, they say they've accepted Jesus as, a, as their Savior, the family gets a little upset, but they, they don't do anything yet. But when that person gets baptized, you know what the family does? They hold a funeral. And they consider that family member dead from then on. You think it's not a serious act when those people get baptized? It's a very, they take it very seriously. Because they know what's going to happen. We should take it just as seriously. All who come to faith in Christ today should, should get baptized to have a good conscience before God, as it says in these verses. We demonstrate by our obedience to the physical act of baptism that we truly have joined with Jesus in true saving faith. And so therefore, just as Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days after His resurrection and again assumed His position in the, in the heavenly realm that He had had for eternity beforehand before He took on a human body and came to earth, what we celebrate at Christmas time, one day we also will rise in glory because we are saved from sin, death, and the grave through the same resurrection power that brought Jesus back from the dead. And to that, I say, Amen. Verses 1 and 2 in chapter 4. And there's that first word. What's that first word? Therefore. Therefore. Because of the stuff that we had just studied, especially in chapter 3. Therefore, it says, Since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with what? The same attitude. The same attitude as who? Christ. Jesus Christ. Because he who has suffered in his body is what? Done with sin. And as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. As always, who's our prime example of how we're to live? Jesus. Always. Our prime example. Our model as believers. Since Jesus suffered and died in His commitment to the will of His Father in Heaven, Christians are supposed to have that same kind of attitude of commitment to the will of God. We too are be, to be willing to suffer for our faith. Those who are willing to suffer because of their faith in Jesus show that they really are done with sin. As we saw in verse 1, they show that they have crucified their sinful nature, Galatians 5.24 that they have died to sin, Romans chapter 6. After we accept Jesus as our Savior and true saving faith, we are not to live for the sinful things of the world, the sinful pleasures of the world. Instead, we're to live according to the will of God, even if that means we have to suffer for it. 
And that way of life then demonstrates that living not the way everybody else does, but the way God tells us to, then that demonstrates to everyone that we have identified with Jesus. He is our Lord. So we should follow Him, right? If Jesus is our Lord and our King, why would we act like pagans? Why would we live like unbelieving people? If, in fact, Jesus truly is our Lord. Are you done with sin? If you claim salvation through Jesus, you should be. Again, that, just quickly, that doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. But what it means is we, we will know we should not purposely, deliberately sin. We should not purposely engage in sinful things. Things that God says in His Word are sin. We should not engage in those things as deliberate acts. Yes, at times we'll, you know, lose our temper or do something like that. And we should very soon thereafter seek forgiveness for that and, and apologize to the Lord for, because we're not supposed to do that. But I'm talking about we make a decision to go and sin. We make a decision that we're going to go party hardy and get drunk. We make a decision to go and commit sexual immorality. We make a decision to cheat or, or lie on things to, you know, for financial purposes. Whatever. These things that we, we make decisions to do, we purposely commit sin. That is not how a follower of Jesus is supposed to act. And we shouldn't. Verses 3 through 5. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery and lust and drunkenness and orgies and carousing and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange, this is the unbelievers, the pagans, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. It means they, they think it's weird. Why, why aren't you doing this stuff with us? And they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to Him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The people that Peter originally wrote to, the, the group of people that the Holy Spirit originally led Peter to write these words to, they at one time were pagans before they became believers. And as pagans, as unbelievers, they willingly engaged in years of deliberately sinful behavior like the kinds of things that are listed here in verse 3. Unbelievers today, of course, still do those kinds of things. Surely it's obvious that as believers we should not do those kinds of things anymore. We shouldn't live like pagans. We should live like who? Jesus. The thing is, when we do live like Jesus, when we refuse to do the sinful things that the unbelievers are doing, especially if they're for friends who we used to do those things with, and now we're not doing them anymore. Oh, what up? You get to be a holy roller now. You get to you find religion. Stuff like that, right? That's some of what's being spoken to here. These people still expect us to do the same things we used to do with them. And when we don't, the abuse often begins. Those who are still without Jesus in their lives often show hostility against believers when we live the way we're supposed to live according to God's Word, the Bible. Sometimes it's just teasing, maybe a little mocking, but it can get a lot worse. Sometimes really worse. John 3 verse 20 says, Everyone who does evil hates the light. What's the light represent? The light represents being in Jesus, being in the truth of the word of, the word of God. Unbelievers hate that. But believers are supposed to stand strong and stay in the light in the face of evil treatment and even in the face of hate. The Bible says that God will judge all human beings. And the New Testament specifically says that who has been given the act of judgment? Actually, Jesus Himself. Jesus, it says in John 5, verses 22 and 23, Jesus is the one who will actually bring judgment. Now, boy, does that go against the grain of what you hear about the Jesus of people today. People believe in this Jesus that doesn't line up with the Bible. The people that say Jesus would never judge anybody, you better read the Bible. 
because it says God the Father actually gave over judgment to God the Son. Jesus will be the one that pronounces the death sentence on all the unbelievers of all the ages and sent sentences them to the, the lake of fire for the rest of all eternity. Jesus will one day judge all unbelievers, unbelievers long dead and unbelievers alive on the day the judgment begins. And in that judgment, which we call, it's called in Revelation chapter 20, what? What's that judgment referred to as? The great white throne judgment. Again, Revelation, see Revelation chapter 20. Unbelievers, including ones that treated us poorly as, as believers, will have to give an account of their lives to Jesus. How do you think that's going to turn out? I can tell you not well. And you want to read again Revelation chapter 20 if you don't believe that. Verse 6. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. Now, this is one of those verses that people struggle to understand. What's this? Pre preaching to dead people? No, that's, 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 it says people are now dead. It's not, pre it's not about preaching to dead people. This is, again, we saw in verse 5 that unbelievers who abuse Christians in various ways will one day face what? Judgment. But the question may be, well, okay, so they're going to get judged one day, but, but what about believers who suffered you know, under, their, under their persecution? What about believers who even they even killed? They, they don't, they're not going to... You know, that, that suffering is not going to be taken away somehow after it's already happened. And if they're dead, they're, they're not going to get their life back, right? So how is that that the, these, these people that did that kind of stuff to you are going to get punished someday? Well, that doesn't, how does that make it any better now? How does that help us today, right? You know what the answer is? It, it's not going to. <laughs> the, the only thing that can help us is knowing that one day they will... God, God will reverse the course of things and they will get their punishment. But what are we going to get if we're true, true believers in Jesus? Eternity in paradise. That's what this is all, all about. The time for Jesus to judge could happen at any time. He could return and start God's final dealings with mortal human beings this afternoon before we even get out of here. That truth should motivate us to live for Jesus and to serve Him with all of our hearts. When Jesus was on the earth, He taught that His followers should live like they expected Him to return at any time. You can see Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 17. We're supposed to live as, as though we expect that Jesus will come back this afternoon. That's how we're supposed to be living. Jesus Himself said that. So we're to remain spiritually alert, and we're to remain in constant communication and relationship with our Lord Jesus. And if being in a relationship, a regular relationship with Jesus sounds weird, we need to talk. Because that's what it's supposed to be like for followers of Jesus. Verses 8 and 9. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Well, so it says, above all, that would tell us what? That this is a big deal. Like this is a primary responsibility for believers, right? Above all, we are to what? We're, we're to love each other. And, and, and I, I want to make the distinction. I've done this before. Yes, we're supposed to love everybody, even our enemies. But the Word of God, especially in the New Testament, relative to the church, says very often, stresses, that we are to love each other as fellow believers. Because guess what the world is going to do relative, relative to us? Jesus said the world's going to hate us. We need to love each other. We who have truly accepted Jesus in saving faith are to love each other, love one another. That's what this is about. Though we are commanded to love even our enemies, this is one of the many verses in the Bible that says we are to love our fellow believers above all else. And that's not always easy to do, is it? Rhoda even doesn't love me sometimes. Amen. Amen. 
This love is to be a deep love, an earnest love. It's what kind of love? The Greek word, agape love. You know, we can be commanded to love in that way. You know why? First of all, why, why can't you be commanded to love in a, a, a huggy, squeezy kind of way? You can't be commanded to feel, right? I mean, you feel, you can act like it. You can act like you love someone, but, you, you know, to be commanded to feel that huggy, squeezy love, you, you can't command somebody to feel. But the thing is, that's actually phileo love, the Greek word phileo, but agape love, that kind of love is a choice. That's a decision of the will. That you decide that you're going to demonstrate love to someone. That you are going to show love to them. That's the kind of love we're called to have for each other. Furthermore, the reason for us to love each other is that love covers what? A multitude of sins. Now, how, how does love cover over a multitude of sins? Well, it's a, it's a quotation from Proverbs 10, verse 12. And first, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. <clears throat> love doesn't cover over our sins by making atonement for them. We don't make up for our sins. We don't become forgiven because we love. That's not what this means. What it does, means, it does mean is that the primary idea is that love suffers in silence and bears all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7. It means that love covers over sins by the fact that when we love someone who maybe has sinned against us, someone who has not treated us real well, whatever the case may be, that whenever we bear with that and just, as, as Elsa would sing what? And people saying, Elsa, who's Elsa? Let it go, let it go. Huh? No, you, you people that don't have like younger kids or grandkids, you're like, I don't know what he's even talking about. It's, you have to ask somebody else about it. Anyway, when, when somebody does that stuff to you, you let it go. And so you cover over actually their sins by just letting it go. Don't make a federal case out of it, as we used to say. I don't know if you say that anymore either. I'm getting old. Don't make a big deal about it. Just let it go. That's how love can cover over. You, you make a willful decision to just let it go when someone doesn't treat you right. You just let it go. That's how love covers over a multitude of sins. Christians forgive faults in each other because we realize what? Who, what, what has happened for us if we've accepted Jesus Christ in saving faith? How many sins have you had forgiven by Jesus? Huh? And how many of them? Just a couple sins? Is that all you have, Rick? Just a couple sins? You didn't really need too much forgiven, right? Huh? Tammy doesn't agree with that. She said, no, no. Think of the amount of sin that Jesus forgives us of. And that's what we're called to do then as his followers. We are to forgive others, understanding of what we've been forgiven of. Our fellow, again relative to dealing with our fellow believers. <clears throat> the Greek word translated hospitality here in, in these verses has the meaning of being friendly to strangers. Therefore, we should show hospitality to any fellow believer, whether we know them or not, and we're to do it without what? What's it say at the end of that verse? Do it without grumbling. Hmm. So that means, uh, that points to what? If we're to do it without grumbling, that means, well, I don't really feel like doing that. They don't deserve this, but okay, I'm, I'll, I'll do this for them, but they don't deserve it. Huh? You think, think that's what God has in mind? Huh? Now, we're to do it without grumbling. We're to, to do it with the right attitude, with the right heart. And here, here again, what, what does God look most at? The outward act that we do or what's going on in here? So I not only have to show love to them, but I have to do it with the right attitude. It's really getting tough to love me now, isn't it, Rhoda? I do love you. Thank you. Okay. Verses 10 and 11. Each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... They should do it as one speaking the very words of God. 
If anyone serves, you should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be, may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Every Christian is in some way capable of ministering to others. Every Christian has a gift. See Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Every Christian has a gift given to them by God. And again, what are we all to use our gifts for, according to verse 10? Verse 10? Serving others. We are to use the gifts that God has given us to serve others. Especially again, talking about within the body of Christ, within the body of believers. One of the long-standing misconceptions in churches is the idea that the preacher is the only one who ministers in the church. That's baloney. The reality is the Bible says all believers are gifted to serve and are supposed to serve in one way or another. The phrase in verse 10, faithfully administering, is actually, it could be translated, we're to be good stewards. And that's actually translated from a Greek word we looked at back in chapter 3, oikonomos, that actually had, that referred to household servants. And what the idea here is that we are to faithfully administer, we are to be good stewards of these gifts that God has given us. The, the gifts, we don't have anything in the gifts. The gifts aren't because we achieved the gift or anything. God gave it to us. He gave us the resources and we're supposed to use the resources as He tells us to, how He commands us to do them. Just like a household servant, an oikonomos, would had no resources of their own, but if they managed the household for their master, they would take the master's resources and use them however the master told them to use them. You follow? That's the way we're supposed to use the gifting that we have. We're to, it's, not, it's not ours. God gave it to us. And we're to obey Him and use it the way He tells us to use it for the benefit of others, not for the benefit of ourselves. The grace, that grace of God in giving us this gifting, it shows itself in various ways. Verse 11 groups the manifestations of God's grace really into two main categories. They would, the first one would be, would be what? Maybe speaking? And what, what's the second one? In verse 11 there, serving. It's kind of divided into speaking and serving. Those who speak um, probably would include those who teach and preach and probably include uh, wisdom and and knowledge and discernment and those types of things. And those who speak are charged to do it as one speaking what? The very words of God, it says in that verse. Again, keep your fingers on these verses. Teachers and, and preachers need to take this very seriously about speaking the very words of God because we're to teach and preach from what? From the Bible, from the Word of God. Understanding that we as teachers and preachers will be judged by God more strictly than the majority of Christians who don't teach because of the influence that we can have in our teaching and preaching. And I assure you, I take that very seriously. That I will stand before God one day and I will be judged more strictly than those who do not do what I do because of the potential of me misleading people. Now, I take that very seriously. The grace of serving, then, the other category, that would include things like administrative work, prayer, mercy, um, works of help. Serving is to be empowered with the strength that God provides, which means by dependence with the help, on the help of the, of the Holy Spirit. See Ephesians 3, verse 16. As Christians, the body of Christ, serve each other with the gifts of grace, the enabling of the Holy Spirit, given us by God, then God is glorified as we do that. We actually glorify God in using the gifts that He has given us to serve each other within the church. Indeed, to God be the glory and the power. Amen. As it says at the end of those verses. Verses 12 and 13. I'm going to head down the home stretch. I think I can do it. Sometime before 1 o'clock this afternoon. I don't want to scare you there. No, I can, I, I can get this done in, in good order. Verses 12 and 13, read with me. We're going to finish out chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at what? At the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. 
But, but what? No, wait a minute. What are we talking about here? Painful trials and suffering. Rejoice. Uh, something must be a misprint. Is that what your Bible says? Well, that's not a misprint. Hmm. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. This idea of Christian suffering because of our faith, this is actually suffering because we're Christians. Wait a minute. Doesn't, doesn't there a popular teaching thing that says that, that when, we, when we follow Jesus and we do all the enough right things, we're, we're going to experience all good, right? Unfortunately, that doesn't line up real well with the Bible. Actually, it says here we're not supposed to be thinking that it's something unusual or shocking in any way if we suffer because of being a follower of Jesus. We should look at it as being a refining test. We already read about the necessity of our faith being refined through suffering and testing in chapter 1, verses, especially verses 6 and 7 of 1 Peter. And of course, I said before, Jesus said, if the world hate, hates me, what? It's gonna, the world's going to hate you too. Remember that it hated me first. John the Apostle later on wrote in 1 John chapter 3, Hey, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. You shouldn't be surprised at that. You shouldn't be surprised that you're going to get mistreated by non-Christians. Now, when you get mistreated by people that claim to be a Christian, then, that's, then, then there's some other things there we'd have to deal with, but not today. By what Jesus said, by what He experienced, we should actually expect to be persecuted for our faith. The deal is, folks, Christians in other parts of the world cannot... They are, they're amazed that we don't suffer persecution. You, 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 if you would ever talk with or even read about a, uh, Christians in parts of the world where like, they regularly face like jail and even death for, just for being a Christian... But they accept, they, they understand, well, the Bible says we're gonna, that's what's going to happen. They, they accept that. But then they hear about Christianity like around here. How many in here ever went to jail because of your faith in Jesus? Well, you know, we can go down, we're not going to raise our hands to any of the stuff that these people face all the time. They can't believe, well, but the Bible says you're going to face it. They can't believe that we don't. About the worst thing that happens to us is we get made fun of, right? Sometimes in the workplace, things can get a little dicey if you live out your Christian faith. Sometimes it can get a little problematic, but all in all, we don't really have to face that much. And what's the other reason we don't face persecution? I hate to say it, but I'm gonna. You know the, one of the big reasons we don't face much persecution? Because we don't live any different than anybody else around us. When people look at a lot of us, they don't see anything different than every, any all the other unbelievers around them. And I lived that life for a long time. Not supposed to be that way. In contrast to the usual response of sorrow and shock to suffering and persecution, we're actually supposed to what? Said in these verses here. Rejoice. If you want to look at other New Testament passages that talk about suffering with Christ, this idea of participating in the sufferings of Christ, you can look in Romans chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 3, and if you want some examples of Christians rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus, you can look in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 16. For time, I'm not going to go over all those. The reason believers can rejoice and have even joy in the midst of suffering is because we understand that just as we share in Christ's suffering, so also we're going to share in what? His what? Starts with a G. His glory. On the great day He was revealed to the earth on His second coming. And also, as we suffer for our faith in Jesus, our relationship with Jesus deepens and grows. That should be a cause for rejoicing. And i got to say to you again, something is missing in your faith. If, if you don't really even get this having a relationship with Jesus business, like if you don't understand what it's like to go through life, like even hourly, talking to Jesus, sharing things with Him, seek, seeking to, to understand from His, 
from His Word more than just for a little bit of time on a Sunday morning. You know, if, if this stuff is foreign to you, th th there's an issue. There's an issue you really need to deal with. You really need to look at your faith. Verse 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are what? Blessed. Blessed. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. He said that in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. In Matthew, the cause for happiness is the reward of heaven. If you look at that passage in, in Matthew, the happiness, the source of it is primarily around because of the, the promise of reward in heaven. Here in verse 14, it is the promise of the Holy Spirit living and working in us is the cause for rejoicing that in this verse 14 that we just read. It says, For the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. One of God's great characteristics is His glory. And in Jesus, the glory of God is revealed. And remember, the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of God the Son lives where? Lives in us, inside of us. If we have placed saving faith in Jesus, we have the Spirit of God the Father, the Spirit of God the Son, actually living inside of us and communicating with our spirit and leading us in the directions we should go so that we have something to counter the leading of our own sinful nature, which is trying to lead us away from the way God would say to go. And we constantly have that battle going on within us. And we need to become sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit within us so that we follow His leading and do what the Word of God tells us to do instead of doing what we want to do. Because that's a product of our sinful nature. Verses 15 and 16. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But what? Praise God that you bear, what? That you bear that name. We, now, first of all, we need to remember that just because someone is suffering doesn't mean that they are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Just, and that, that includes believers. Just because a believer is suffering, that doesn't, they, doesn't mean that they're necessarily, well, I'm sharing in the sufferings of Christ. When, when would a, even a believer not be sharing in the sufferings of Christ in their suffering? If they're suffering because of sin. If, if, if I'm suffering as, as a believer because I've done something in disobedience of, that God would say is sin, then my suffering isn't getting me any, any, any kind of credits to suffering with Christ or for Christ. I'm suffering because I did something wrong and I deserve to suffer. Maybe I deserve to suffer because of, I deserve punishment from fellow human beings. And maybe I also deserve punishment from God Himself because this opens up the subject of, yep, sorry if you don't like it. Again, you want to sit down, we'll talk about it. I'll show you multiple places in the Bible. God disciplines His people on this earth. God disciplines us. And there are times when we do wrong that God brings things on us as discipline. And it says in 1 Corinthians 11 that even sometimes when we're sick, it is as punishment. And even sometimes when people die, when believers die, it's actually punishment from God. Now hear me, not every time, but if a believer is engaged in ongoing sin, even sickness and death can be a discipline from God because of it. That's what Scripture says. And that's some of what's being talk talked about here in these verses that we're reading now. Much suffering is actually the punishment for or consequences of sin. You think about earthly consequences to... You, you, there are certain things that God says we shouldn't do and so does our, the law of our land. And we do them, we can end up in jail. And that can be punishment even from earthly authorities, let alone what punishment we might get from God. Suffering of sin, suffering because of sin is nothing to rejoice about. If we suffer, it ought to be because of our relationship with Jesus, not because we did something evil. Little side note here quickly, the title Christian, that's used in these verses here, 15 and 16, really common, right? 
common term today, the word Christian, the title Christian, that comes from the Greek word Christianos. Do you know that the, this is one of only three times that that term is used in the Bible? Would you ever have thought that? The term Christian is actually only used three times. Here in 1 Peter and twice in the book of Acts. In the beginning, Christians were known as actually Jews or disciples or believers or people who belonged to the way. It wasn't until the church started in the city of Antioch that the term Christian started to be used in reference to followers of Jesus. And I can tell you that most of the time it was likely used as a derogatory term by unbelievers. They started to refer to people that followed Jesus, oh, those Christians, those little Christs. That, it was primarily used in, in those days of the early church as something derogatory. In any case, it is still true that we should not be ashamed, but instead we should praise God that we are called Christians. Verses 17 and 18. Three verses to go and we're done. For it is time for judgment to begin with who? Yikes. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? I see and hear a lot of people who do not understand the difference between temporary suffering on earth as judgment from God on believers versus permanent suffering in the lake of fire as a judgment of unbelievers. Many people don't understand that God still holds believers accountable for how we live. But that accountability is not related to our eternal destiny because God has said we will be with Him in paradise forever. But He still holds us accountable for how we live. God administers earthly discipline to believers as I've spoken of before. And you can also, in addition to 1 Corinthians 11, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12. But God will never eternally condemn true believers Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1, among other verses. And one of the ways God disciplines us is by allowing persecution. God allows persecution um, also probably because it ties into this purification of us, purification of our faith. As we've discussed before, when do we grow the most spiritually? Anybody still with me? When times are tough is when we tend to grow the most spiritually. When times are going well, we tend not to grow that much spiritually because we tend to get into that rut of, well, everything's cool and I don't need God. We don't say it in so many words usually, but that's what it kind of turns out to be. Suffering purifies our faith. And so God's judgment starts with His own children, it says, meaning His discipline of us here on earth. And the two questions in these verses then essentially ask the same rhetorical question, if God disciplines His children in these kinds of ways, how can we even imagine the punishment He's going to bring on unbelievers? If God brings harsh punishment at times upon His own children, believers, man, what's going to happen to unbelievers? That's what these verses are saying. When verse 18 says that it's hard for the righteous to be saved, that doesn't mean that we have to work really hard to get saved. It means that the righteous, which is another name for believers because we are given the righteousness of Christ, that we often must go through hard times. Hard times of discipline and refinement and purification of our faith because of our ongoing sins in this temporary earthly life before we get promoted to heaven. And so again, it's difficult to even imagine what unbelievers will face someday. What will happen to, what will become of unbelievers if God's children have to go through such difficult stuff in life as we do. If that's the case, if God brings that upon us as His children, wow, what is He going to bring upon unbelievers? You follow? That's the, that's the tenor of these verses. Last verse, verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to what? Yes, if you suffer, it is according to God's will. We don't like that either. I can't go into, we talked about this kind of stuff in Sunday school this morning, but we don't like it. But we, if we suffer, we are suffering according to God's will because there is nothing that happens that God is not unable to stop. And so therefore, if He is unable to stop it and doesn't, He's allowing us to suffer, right? Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to do what? Commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. The whole deal here is, 
I think it basically concludes that, you know, a concluding statement that Christians who are suffering according to the perfect will of God are to commit themselves to Him and keep on keeping on, as I like to say, and Dot likes to say, keep on keeping on. When we're, when we're doing our best to live in obedience to God and to be a witness for Jesus in the world, but yet we seem to be only getting suffering out of it, what's our natural tendency? Our natural tendency is, I think, to say, well, geez, you know, I, I think I've been doing pretty good and this is what I get. I might as well give up. I might as well just do what I want to do, right? But what Jesus says is rejoice that you are sharing in His sufferings. And someday you will share in the glory of Jesus for all of eternity. So keep on doing good. Keep on keeping on. This is some more tough stuff from the perfect Word of God this morning. How can we do it then? How can we keep on keeping on when stuff is really tough? How can we do it? I say only by hanging on to Jesus. Honestly, Dodd, I say not suck it up because suck it up. No, seriously. If I just say, well, I just have to suck it up, that's my own strength. That means I've got to just buck up and put my big boy pants on and I've got I to gotta handle it. That ain't going to cut it, honestly. The only way I'm going to be able to do it is I've got to hang on to Jesus. The only way I'm going to make it is through Him. Only with Jesus by my side, every hour of every day of my life, and you too. Oh Jesus, I need thee every hour. That's our closing hymn, number 638. Would you turn there and stand as we close? 638.